Tommy Robbins, a villain to many, but a hero to some. We have laws in this country to prohibit hate speech. I've never been arrested for anything to do with racism, anything to do with hate speech. Many people have been silenced in this country for decades through the accusation of racism. Speech isn't free if it has consequence. And right now it has consequence. Political persecution. How can I be sent to prison for asking a paedophile how he feels about his sentence? That's all I ask. I do talk openly about Islam and I have a problem with the Islamic ideology because it has a problem with me as a non-Muslim, so I'll talk about it. That doesn't mean I have a problem with every single Muslim. Islam is an idea, Muslims are people. I should be free to criticise this idea as much as I want. Yeah. Islam is an idea, but, a bad idea. And, it, Islam and is a faith. No, it's an idea. It's faith. a faith. It's an idea that you can change your mind. No, it's a faith, like Christianity. Like Scientology. A hate crime carries a more severe sentence. So why are these men who are raping kids who are openly saying why they're doing it. Yeah? They're making racial slurs every time to the victims. Yeah, I can see you're very passionate about it. Yeah, I do, about, and about... I, get I get passionate about it because I travel the country and I meet these kids, all, their women, all the women, and it is horrifying and devastating. My question to you is that you talk about Muslim extremism, as you should, but you don't mention... There's no groups of EDL or groups of the far right picking up young Muslim girls and raping them. It's not happening. Luton went from when I was born in 1982 to one mosque. We've now got over 40. What point? No, that's not bad. You know, it's, no, it's it, is, it is a bad thing because Mohammed beheaded 600 people in one day. Is he, he a good guy? Yeah. He married a six-year-old and he shagged her when she was nine. Is he a good guy? Black Lives Matter as an organisation is, is, has got nothing to do with black people. It's created to cause division and it happens every time there's an election in the United States, they come to prominence. I look at Gareth Southgate's football team and you're all getting on your knees and you're going to take our football club out and play in Qatar, are you? Where 6,000 people have died building those stadiums. There's still slavery now, yeah? And what are you going to do about it? Are you going to wear your rainbow armband in Qatar? No, you're not, right? You're not. Notorious right-wing group accused of being violent racists who have taken to the streets to fight what they view as homegrown Islamic extremists. I despise Nazis as much as I despise Islamists. Am I willing to be the public face for them? No, I'm not. People have to understand, I was leader of a street protest movement. Our job was to put pressure on the Muslim community and the government. Yeah. I, I thought we'd march in our thousands, we'd wake them up from within, they'd end up turning on the radicals. It had it caused like a revolution within their community. It, it, it didn't. At the end, he comes over, I stick fucking holes in you. Yeah? This scumbag. I tried to find him. And, it, and I, I said, I'm with my fucking kids. And he goes, fuck your kids. And my kids sit there, they start crying. And uh, and from then, my son started having panic attacks. And the first thing I done when that happened is I, I said to the counsellor, dude, I said, I need to bring home. I need to get my son a counsellor. Oh, I don't know. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Ring Inspire Printing and Old Snap Cardiff. If you haven't already, make sure you press that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. The decision of today's guest didn't come with a simple yes. We've had many guests on in the past who have questionable views and may have done questionable things. If we were part of the mainstream media or part of an institution, then this wouldn't happen. But with a voice for adversity, with a voice for the unheard and sometimes the unhinged. To our already loyal followers, I know you'll give us this chance at this interview. If you're new here, we promise that there is no place for hate speech, but we do have time for free speech. I may be a little bit out of my depth here, but I want to know myself, what makes this man tick? Where does the name, the reputation and the hate come from, both directed at him and also from himself? So ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you, Mr. Tommy Robinson. You doing all right? Yeah, thank you for coming. It's all right. There's no hate from me, though. Yeah, that's good to know. It's there's good no to know. hate from me. Well, when I said that before we came in, you, you said there's never been hate speech from me. No hate speech, no. We have laws in this country to prohibit hate speech. I've never been arrested for anything to do with racism, anything to do with hate speech ever in my life. Um, so, yeah, there's no hate speech from me. There's, there's truth, and sometimes people who don't like the truth like to prevent you talking it, and to prevent you talking it, they like to throw accusations of racism or hate speech. And I think many people have been silenced in this country for decades through the accusation of racism. So people are too scared. They might think something, but they're too scared to say it. And that's been purposely done to silence people, to take away their free speech. Because 
speech isn't free if it has consequence. And right now it has consequence. You lose your job, you're scared, you get violently attacked for expressing what is free speech. Do you think if you look back in the past, over the last, you know, if we go back 30, 40 years, though, it was probably the free speech was reckless, the way we, you know, we target, it was dangerous in a way. No, I don't see that. No, because we've always had laws. Incitement of racial hatred is the law we have in the UK, yeah? That's to stop people inciting hate against different races. We have that law. Anything you say that's truthful or factual, no matter how much people don't like it, if I want to sit here and talk about Islam or I want to talk about the Quran or I want to talk about facts to do with Muhammad, it's not hate speech. It's the truth. And the more you attack it, the more you try to silence people, um, you take away the ability for people to listen. And so when you, when you stop my free speech, like I'm, I'm deleted from every social media there is, every single one of them I'm banned from. They're not just silencing me, but they're, they're silencing you. They're stopping you have the ability to make your own mind up. You don't get both sides of the story. You'll just get told who I am and how to think about me. You go and search my videos online, you won't find any, any of my videos anymore. You can't access them. The videos I've made, which contradict the, the, the view the mainstream media have given me. So, and that's purposely done as well. Yeah. Well, I think that is definitely one thing we can agree on. You know, free speech is a must. I do think everyone should have an opportunity to, you know, voice their opinion, whatever that may be. You have to. We have to. You have to have free speech because it's, it's the bedrock of our society. Yeah. Okay, so I want to kind of jump in first. In, uh, first question, really. Um, it's a bit different how we do this, but um, I want to kick the interview off by asking you, if you had a time machine and you could go back 10, 15, 20 years, would you do anything different? No, not a single thing. Really? Yeah, but that doesn't mean I haven't done things that are wrong. It just means that I think that you learn from making those mistakes. So I've had, someone asked me this before, would you, ch would you change it? Um, so I've been to prison, I've been to 10 different prisons in the UK due to my activism, yeah? for ridiculous little stupid petty crimes that the government have managed to get me on. Um, one of the things I've done was I was outside Leeds Crown Court and there were 30 men on trial for raping children and I've done a video outside that court and if you watch anyone who watches this anyone who's watched the video has seen the corruption of the courts because in the video I've clearly said because yeah, I'm from Luton Town some of the best people I met growing up are Muslim lads yeah? um, I do talk openly about Islam and I have a problem with the Islamic ideology because it has a problem with me as a non-Muslim so I'll talk about it that doesn't mean I have a problem with every single Muslim the majority, vast majority of Muslims in the UK are not following to the word of Islam they're not following the book of the Quran they don't even many of them they won't even know what it says in there just like most Christians won't know what every word in the Bible is Yeah, I can agree with that just how people live most people I'd say are cultural Muslims it's part of their identity so when I talk about Islam they do feel that I'm attacking them whereas Islam is an idea Muslims are people I should be free to criticise this idea as much as I want. You know, say whatever I want. If I want to mock it, um, make mockery of it, joke about it, you should be free to. Yeah? Talking about individuals, you ne you'll never find me talking about Muslims, yeah? per se, Muslims. I talk about Islam. I have a problem with Islam. And um, so I, I was outside the court and there were 30 men on trial and they've been raping children for a generation. They've been raping all these young girls, torturing them. Um, and what the, the courts do now is they put uh, reporting restrictions on these trials. So no one's allowed to talk about them. Yeah? So then at the end of the trial, you get one day's news on, on what's happened to these girls. You won't get the in-depth, and I know the in-depth because I read every one of the trials, of what they've said to them, whether they've been called gullah, whether they've been called dirty white bitches. It's all racial. The, the horrific crime, some of the victims have had their tongues nailed to tables. One girl, they hit, they heated up an iron rod with a letter M on it because she was the property of Mohammed and they scolded her bum. She was, a property, she was his property. These are the crimes, of, these are the details people need to hear, in my opinion. So as the men were walking into court, I went outside court, I made it very clear, yeah? I've got mates I've grown up with who are Muslim who had punched these lads' heads in over what they've done, yeah? I'm not saying this is every Muslim doing this crime. What I am saying is that Muslims make up 4 or 5% of the UK, Muslim men make up 2% of the UK, they're responsible for 90% of the convictions in this group gang rape uh, convictions, 90% from, from 4 or 5% of the population. 30% of the men convicted are called Muhammad. There's a problem, yeah? Unless we understand why they're acting in this way, unless we can get to the bottom of it, and unless the parents understand, these are the telltale signs. So I went through and done an hour video. These are the detailed signs of what's happening to your daughter. And it was an important video, yeah? And it's important people are aware of this. As the men walked into court, I made it very clear, do not, I'm not here to assume their guilt, yeah? They're on trial. They might walk out of here with a not guilty, yeah? I'm here to see what's going on. The, the trial's over. And as the gentleman walked into court, I said, how do you feel about your verdict? Judge come outside, uh, the police come outside, they arrest me for a suspected breach of the peace. 
You can watch the video. I was so calm in the video, so polite in the video, yeah? I made sure of it. Where was you, sorry? This is outside Leeds Crown Court. Yeah? And I've gone to work. This one I'm doing, I was doing as a job. I was a okay. reporter. And I've gone outside and um, the police have come. They've took me out. They've arrested me. Took me to the police station. I got to the police station under, uh, under a breach of the peace. And then they took me straight to court from the police station. I went before the judge. I wasn't even asked to plead guilty or not guilty. I was in jail for 13 months within two hours. So the same day? <laughs> within two hours. On the prison, I was on a van on the way to prison. And I, I was like, what is I've going I've never on? heard of that before. It's never happened before. That's why. It's never happened before. And I was on the way to jail. And then the judge put a reporting restriction, not just on that trial, but he put a reporting restriction on anyone being able to report that I was in jail. So then people heard I was in jail. Word was going I was in jail. America reported it because he can't. Yeah, the, the courts have no jurisdiction there. Canada was reporting it. Australia was reporting it. And by the Monday, this happened on the Friday, I believe by the Monday, the judge was forced to remove the reporting restrictions. Then it went out. I'd been sentenced to 13 months in jail for asking a convicted paedophile, because that's what he was. So when they took me to jail that day, they let the man... I asked the man, how you feel about your verdict, yeah? They let him go. He still hasn't faced justice. He went home, got his suitcases, and he disappeared. So he wasn't a convicted paedophile then? He was, yeah. He, they, they, he was found guilty. Yeah, he was found guilty, but he'd gone. So before he come back on the Monday, he's gone. He's never been... 29 of them went to jail. One of them... How was he allowed to leave? I, I, they were all allowed to leave. They were all on bail for two years. Oh, right, okay. He was bailed. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was bailed. He's never come back. I was sent to straight out of jail. I was the danger. Yeah? Not the man who's been raping the children. And then, so for that, that is the case. So I was given 13 months in jail after 11 weeks. There were, this is where most people would have heard, or my name blew up at this time. There was... Uh, 600,000 British people signed a petition to have me released from jail. 30,000 people marched on Parliament. Um, because people who watch... I, well, as they arrested me in the back of the police wagon, I said, millions are going to watch this video. Because for me, it's just, for me, for me wanting to raise awareness of these crimes, it was a success. Yeah? You sent me to jail. It was terrible. I didn't like it. I had a terrible time. It caused me massive problems. But for the awareness of sexual exploitation of our daughters, it was a success. And I went to jail, and after 11 weeks, they got, it took 11 weeks, even trying to get a legal meeting, I couldn't get a legal meeting. So the day my, I was in, I was in HMP Hole, my legal meeting was booked. It took three weeks for them to get me a lawyer, yeah, to, to see my lawyer. Uh, the lawyers coming in, say, on the Thursday, on the Thursday morning, they come and took me out and shipped me to another jail. And they shipped, shipped me from HMP Hole, which has a 5% Muslim population, to HMP Onley, which has a 35%. The biggest Muslim population of any CCAT prison in the country is HMP Only, where they, where they transferred me. It's like, what are you doing? What are you trying to say there? I know, well, I know what they were doing. Um, it doesn't make sense. What, what reason with the prison system? They know who I am. They know the problems I face, yeah? They know that many Muslims, let alone in jail, don't agree with me. Um, I've had, there's six Muslim, no, five Muslims now in jail doing 30 years. They got caught with guns, bombs and IEDs on the way to kill me. They know what's going on. Yeah, they know what they're doing. So they transferred me down there and then they used the excuse. So when I went into that jail, I got there, I said, like, why am I here? And they said, I, you're in danger here. I said, no shit. Like, well done. Like, why have you brought me here? Are you going to you're gonna have to go on voluntary um, isolation? I said, no, I'm not. I said, you put me on that wing, I'm walking out that door. And if I walk out that door, I'll defend myself in every way possible. So I'm not locking myself away. Yeah? So then they forcefully locked me away on solitary confinement for, 11, for another 10 weeks. And, um, but that's when you say, would I change anything? Because even, so after, after, 11, after 11 weeks or whatever, my, someone bangs on my cell door and he says, you're going home. And he's shouting, you're going home. I was like, what? And he said, you're going home, turn the TV on, turn the TV on. I turned the TV on, it come up, uh, it was breaking news everywhere. Tommy Robinson be released from jail. Everything they'd done was illegal. Yeah, everything. How so, did, How did you feel when, when you saw that on TV? Um... It was unreal, if I'm honest. So I, I, I had, it was funny actually, because my wife, um, my wife and my kids, we had a holiday booked before, yeah? And we're due to go. Say this happens on the Wednesday. We're meant to be going ho on holiday on the Thursday, yeah? But it was booked a year before. So the, we've done a name change. So my, my wife's mum is then going, because I'm in jail. So the day before, it's breaking news. I'm going home, yeah? So I'm like, I'm going home, man. <laughs> and then, I, and then, and then I, I, I couldn't believe it. It took him about three, four hours to get me out. But when, when, the, when everyone was on lockdown, the screws, I said, can you get me a phone call? And then they took me out. So I rang my solicitor. I said, can I leave the country? He said, yeah, you're free. It's done. Like, you're out. And he goes, everything they've done is unlawful. Yeah, there's no, there's no license. Like, ev done. Everything they've done is unlawful. And I was like, oh my God. So I, I, then I, I said, can I ring my wife? So I rang my wife and said, 
Uh, tell your mum she's not going on holiday. <laughs> tell your mum she ain't going on holiday. Oh, by the way, I'm coming home. And then, um, and I come out of that sentence, and I thought I'd, I'd lost, I'd lost about three stone in in less than three months. And I thought I looked good. So I was thinking I've lost weight. I'm ready to go out. And then uh, take the top off. <laughs> no, I come. I, I I got home and everyone said, "Bruv, you look like a crackhead, man. Like you don't look well." And I, if you watch the videos back, I wasn't well. I wasn't well from the effect of it seems so stupid, yeah. But that small period. The solitary confinement, it sounds so pathetic that just it, it, it did have an adver a massive adverse effect on Of course it will, because, you know, being locked up, being in jail just, anyway be, is bad. Like, yeah, you've, yeah, and it wasn't locked up in a cell. It's, and, it, and it wasn't just, the, uh, I think it was all the stuff that went with it, the fear, the fear of getting hurt or getting killed in there. I had uh, the prison officers knock, and again, I think this is all done on purpose. The prison officers knocked on my door and said, um, where's your wife? I said, I'm locked in here 23 and a half hours a day. Yeah. You don't even let me out when my wife worked at school. I'm not allowed out. I'm only allowed out at lunchtime. So I can't ring my wife. How am I meant to know where my wife is? And they said, well, we've got, there's intel she's going to get attacked with acid. I'm like, okay. So, and they said, don't know where she is. And then just shut the door till the next day. And my head's like, Pfft. and then when I ring home, she's crying, my mum's crying. They've gone to my mum's and my wife's um, to tell them there's intel, you're going to get done with acid, give them some stupid little leaflet that tells them what to do if they get attacked with acid, uh, give them some different things. But I did not, but my, the sad thing is, I don't even know if there was intel they were going to get attacked with acid. I don't know if they're just frying my head. I don't know if they're just frying my head because they know I'm locked in a room. And it worked if they were. But when you say would I change anything, even that, I come out of jail after that and um, I spent a year out and they recharged me for the same offence. I produced a documentary called Panadrama. I don't know if you had a chance. Yeah, to yeah, I've seen, I've seen bits of it. Good man, and and it was pan so when I come out of jail, Panorama had been set to basically destroy me uh, to the public, and I sent someone undercover into Panorama, and I got footage which which nailed them. Yeah? The man in the pub, drinking yeah, a bottle John of wine. Sweeney, the the producer, the the main face of Panorama was planning on making sexual allegations against me. He was planning. He was telling people. He sat there and said, "You say these three things when I interview you." That's not journalism. Yeah? And he was telling them what to say. And then obviously I produced a documentary. It ruined him. It ended his career. The panorama they had on me wasn't allowed to go out. But then within 48 hours, I, had, I was recharged by the Attorney General. I was back in court by the Attorney General. And then um, and it was that, that case then when they said, they offered me a deal if I plead guilty and apologise and I don't go back to jail. But I, I didn't. And, I, and, I went, and it was a difficult one because I went home and spoke to my kids. And saw my son. Well, my son was saying, "You just, just say sorry. Just say sorry." I, I said, "I can't, man. I can't do it. I can't do it because I'm not sorry." And I asked him, which maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I've put too much burden on my kids as well. Because I, I asked him. I said, "He's got two sisters." I said, "Girls, your sister's age being taken. They're being drugged. They're being raped and tortured." If I don't, if I go back to jail on this offence, it will raise the profile of this issue again, like this. Yeah, I said so. And if it saves one girl or one family, then what should I do? He said, "No, you're right. You're right." So, I, and I, I wouldn't change it, but I have put my kids through a lot. I put my family through a lot. I've put them through so more than I could ever dream of. I, I sit there and think, "What well, I put my mum through?" I think, "Gee, I've got three kids. Yeah, I couldn't watch my son do what I've done. I couldn't watch him face what's gone on." But I wouldn't change any of it because I think that it chisel. It's sort of like what you go through or the, those experiences chisel. Your character, um, mind's been up, it's been down. I've been in high places, low places. No rash decisions where you've looked back. I made loads of rash decisions. I made loads of rash decisions. I've actually, for the first time now, and I don't know if it's because I've got older. So, for example, I'll give you an ex There was an ex Recently, many of you would have, a lot of people would have seen there was a film that went out of cinemas and it was cancelled. Lots of Muslims gathered yes. outside. Yeah. I always would have gone and played that film. Like for the last 15 years, I would have gone straight out and put a big screen up in the city centre and played that film. Yeah. I didn't. Um, I think I should have. But maybe I'm in a, in a battle with myself because uh, I'm, maybe I, I was thinking, I never, I said, if you think about consequence, you'll never bring change. And that's how I've lived my life for 15 years. Because if you want to bring about change, you can't think about, well, what if this happens? Because you, I wouldn't leave my front door, would I? So I sort of always just go, boom. If I'm right, I'm going full head, steam ahead. If I think I'm right and, and I'm morally right, then I'm going to do whatever it takes to push this issue. And you knew, and so I'd have been a good leader to the English Defence League. I'd have been a good activist, but probably a terrible time at times dad or a terrible husband. 
Certainly a terrible bloody husband. <laughs> Awful. Well, I, <laughs> so I want to so, like kind sorry, of... Sorry, Jenna. I want to state the obvious here in the sense, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, it's not all Muslims. It's this certain faction, you would say. Um, so sh do you think, looking back or sitting back and thinking of it, is there, there should be another way where all this could be tackled or highlighted without putting everyone in the same basket? Yeah, so... One, there's only one thing I've said where anyone can pull up a negative thing I said, and it was a speech I gave where I said every single Muslim in the UK watching this, yeah, and it was at Tower Hamlets. I said, you got away with maiming and killing on 7-7. Seven seven. If you harm or hurt any British citizens again in our country, you'll feel the full force of the English Defence League. That is a regret. That's probably the only regret I've said. And that's the only thing anyone can pull me, pull me on what I've said. And I said that, people have to understand, I was leader of a street protest movement. Our job was to put pressure on the Muslim community and the government. Yeah? I, I thought we'd march in our thousands, we'd wake them up from within, they'd end up turning on the radicals, they'd end up thinking this is your fault, and it, had, it caused like a revolution within their community. It, it, it didn't. And um, when I left the English Defence League in 2015, 2014, I actually left at that time and I said, I don't see a benefit. And I haven't done it since, yeah, of us marching through a Muslim area. Um, I did, and I think that what happened with the English Defence League was needed at that moment in time in this country. Remember, we'll, we all talk about grooming now, yeah? It's not grooming, it's a it's rape jihad, yeah? But we all talk about grooming. No one knew... It's it. what? It's a rape jihad. It's a, it's a religiously motivated attack of rape being used as a weapon against non-Muslim women in this country and children. And I say that, do you think that's a bit extreme to say that? No, I'm only going by what they say. So Somalian, in, where are we? Bristol, how far is Bristol from here? Just over the river? 30 miles. Okay, so the, miles. In, the, in the Bristol case, he said it was his religious duty to do it. In the Bristol case, the Somali on trial said that. that it, Don't you think that's just a cop-out whilst being in court though? Um, no, um, in, the, in the Newcastle case, they hung their country's flag over the top of her while they all one by one gang raped her. I go by the comments of what they say. Yeah, the, the comments of what they say, the, the girls are called Kafar. I'm going to bury one of the girls that was murdered. He messaged the girl and the bloke the day before saying, I'm going to bury that Kafar bitch. What is a Kafar? It's the most, it's like saying the N-word. It's the most derogatory term you can use. What is the reason these men are raping in the way they're raping? I just go through their comments. Go through their comments from each case, which I go through. Yeah? In, in my episodes I'm doing now, I ask each victim, did they call you anything? I was called a Gura. Gura is a white slag. Yeah? Every single case, Everyone, there's not one, there's not one that isn't, they make racial comments. Now, if white men were raping non-white children and they were making comments, whether it be you, Paki, Sani, or where, whether it be that using the P word or using the M word, yeah, whether it be that, then everyone would say these are race, this is a racial crime. Now we have hate crimes in the UK. Yeah? People are getting done for a hate crime for saying something homophobic, something transphobic. So, these men are raping kids whilst calling them racial terms. Yeah. They're not getting charged with hate crimes. These are the biggest hate crimes, the only real serious hate crimes in this country that are going on. These hate crimes are, are murder, rape, yeah, and they're not being charged with it. Now, hate crime carries, a, the reason why they should is because hate crime carries, a, you could get done for an ABH, you might get 12 months, you get done for a racial ABH, you're getting three years. Yeah? Mm. A hate crime carries a more severe sentence. So why are these men who are raping kids, who are openly saying why they're doing it, yeah, they're making racial slurs every time to the victims. Why are they not being charged with hate crime? Why? But yeah, but so I've... Yeah, I can see you're very passionate about... about yeah, I do, about, and about, I, get about... I get passionate about it because, and sometimes people might mistake my passion for anger. Well, it is anger. But for, um, I travel the country and I meet these kids or, their women, or the women and it is horrifying and devastating to see and it's and it's ang and and it does anger me. It's like the films I'm making now. These men have got away with terror. With when you hear what they've done, they're not just when you hear it. You need to see it. You need to see where these girls are at now. For example, let me play you this. Yeah, did it take two seconds? Let me play you this because um, this is episode four. I went a girl put, a girl put online saying I'm going to be one of the first people to mur to murder one of these men. Yeah, it was a Telford case. One of the Telford men was being released from jail. She's going to murder him. I paid a, a private investigator to find out where this girl was. I went and knocked on her door. She's living in a hostel. Um, and she didn't like me at all, yeah? Um, she was brought up as a bit of a hippie girl, but she was a victim of the Telford gangs. She said she's going to kill him, yeah? Uh, listen.
Becky? No. This goes into the murder of Becky Watson. This is about, she was 13 years old. She was raped from the age of 10. She was killed at 13. The man got 15 months in prison. He come out of prison and, and we interviewed the other girl. When he comes out of jail, he goes on raping the other girl. Yeah? But the, the, the point is that 15 years, 20 years later, that girl has gone to kill herself. Yeah? The co and I see that. So I've met so many of them. And I see the destruction in their lives from these crimes committed decades later. They're destroyed. They are all so damaged, yeah? And the damage done to them, not just them, I look at the consequence of then their children. I look at the consequence of their families, yeah? It's destroyed. They have absolutely destroyed them, yeah? And they're all just swanning around the town in their, in their sports cars. And it, and, and it angers me. And I get, whether it's be passion or anger, and then the, the corruption of the government, the cover-up that's gone on, the little token gesture of... In, in the Telford investigation, the police identified over 200 men. Charged 11. Charged 11. What about the other 189 rapists? What about them? What, they're not getting done. They're not going to get done. This man here, Ahmed Nawaz, who murdered Becky Watson, he got 15 months in jail. I've got three girls. I, I've got three girls that are talking to me that he has anally raped, tortured. They took him up to the woods. They took them out to the woods and they weren't allowed to go home until they'd done everything they wanted them to. They come in minibuses from Birmingham. They bought minibuses of men to haunted houses, yeah? to derelict houses. They bought minibuses of men who one by one queued up and raped these kids. And the, this one victim in my story identifies over 200 of them. I've got 200, over 200 names. And, that, and that's where this, when we say it's a small problem, um, 200 men in Telford is over 20% of the men, male Muslim population between the age of 16 and 70. That's a big problem. 20%. It is, it, is, it is clearly a problem there. Um, but that's every city. But I'm going to say like everyone else, everyone else, and everyone else says it because it is something obvious. It's happening in every culture, Tom. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, The, the vast like, majority, 90% like, of the paedophiles in this country will be weird, white, weird scumbags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, lone predatory paedophiles. This issue of gang rape. So every case I've looked at, yeah, like one that this case in Telford is a father and his three sons all raping the girl together. Yeah. A dad and That's a weird. Brothers. Yeah. This is something inherently different to anything this country's ever seen. Yeah. It's a mindset that most of people won't understand until you take yourself out and put yourself in a mindset of someone who's following that book, yeah? Who's, whose justification is because these girls are scum, because they're not Muslim, because they're worthless. Even if they were Muslim girls, they're worth, fifth, they're worth half of what a man is, according to the scripture. So when they're non-Muslim girls, and then it says very clearly, this is, the, this is what people don't want to hear. People for decades didn't want to talk about the grooming, we have shifted, whether people want to give us the thanks for it or not, we've shifted the over and window. The over and window is what is acceptable to be spoken about. No one would talk about these gangs. Now they talk about them. No one would mention that they're Muslim. Now they do. Now they're, now they're not referred to as Asian. They're referred to majority Pakistani. Yeah? It's shifting and it's shifting. Um, it needs to shift to understanding why they're doing it. And unless you're able to examine why they're doing it, yes, I'm, I'll still be, people be watching this going, yeah, you're a bigot, you're an extremist. If you want to stop it, which is what I want to do, you know, I don't want to meet any more of these girls. I don't want to meet any more. And, and you're right, it is happening in every community. But when 90% of the convictions are Muslim men from a population of just 4 or 5%, we have a huge problem. Yeah, and, and it's great that you're tackling that. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. Um, one thing other people would say as well is, and myself definitely, um, why weren't you... Um, targeting these 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 grooming gangs when you first started the EDL. It would look like, you, you know, you was targeting them in one way yeah. back then and now you're just moving on to something else. No, so if you if you actually... You know, it's... If you, if you watch my Oxford Union speech... I have, yeah. yeah. In the Oxford Union speech, I bring up a leaflet from 2004. I didn't start activism until 2009. In that leaflet where I organised a protest in Luton Town Centre called Ban the Luton Taliban when I was about 20, um, I organised a protest and in that leaflet I say our daughters are being targeted. They're being hooked on drugs, yeah, by paedophile uh, drug gangs. So it's something, something you kind of identified? I identified it in 2004, yeah. My cousin was a victim in Luton of these gangs, yeah. She was abused, raped. No one's seen her now for decades. She's probably got eight kids, I think, wearing a burqa, yeah. So, but she was a victim of these gangs at the age of 14. And when the family were going to the police trying to do something, they just say she's a drug addict. Now she's a child. She climbed back out the window to get back to them for a fix as a kid, yeah. 
but no, none of them face prosecution. No one gets done. And we now know why. We've, we've seen it across the whole country. My, so a lot of people, I do get I do get a lot of people saying, well, you only tackled it, the, how come you're only tackling the brown ones, yeah? Or the, or the Muslim ones. I say, because they're the ones that have been allowed to do this. Actually, not just them, because the Jimmy Saffle and all the elite paedophiles are allowed to do yeah. it as well. Yeah, but this group and this clique of Muslims in every town and city, because they operate like a, like a mafia across the country of raping, they've been facilitated and accommodated by the police and social services. You saw the report last week in, in, in Oldham where the girl went into the police station begging for help and they refused to help her. And the men come in the police station in front of the police and took her back out. And they all went and raped her, six of them. Like the, these, these things that sound unbelievable. Yeah, they, When we were saying them in 2009 when we started the English Defence League, we were called... Uh, hate preachers and you're lying and then the Rotherham report come out and I remember when the Rotherham report come out I was in HMP Winchester and I remember seeing it all burst on the news and then that, that was the start of uh, Do you the, think if this come out uh, someone less controversial than yourself was, was highlighting this then it would I wish be more it, done? Yeah I wish it was and I wish someone did to be honest when I started the English Defence League I used the name Tommy Robinson um, Stephen Yaxley Lennon for all those journalists out there yeah I used the name Tommy Robinson um, and I wore a mask and the reason I'd done it was because I was too scared to talk about it like everyone else yeah I had uh, between me and my partner we had uh, seven properties I had two successful businesses um, I didn't want to ruin my life yeah so I was scared as well like everyone else everyone's scared to talk I was scared to talk I knew the consequence that would come with it and twelve. it took 12 months before I was exposed as who I was now, in that period, I was hoping someone was going to come along once it... Because I remember it wasn't planned. It just went boom. Take the baton. Like. It was like boom. I was hoping someone would come take the baton. And so, am I the wrong person to be talking about this? Yeah, right? Did you realise what, what what you was getting yourself into at no. the time? No, man. No. Me and my cousin, me and my cousin sat there because we knew... I've grown up in Luton. I know how it is. And when I'd done the demonstration in 2004, I was targeted by all the Pakistani gangs, all the drug gangs, yeah? But I went... I was part of the football scene for, for Luton's youth, which is so... I was part of Luton's football hooligan tennis element. culture. Yeah, we would get... We could muster numbers. What a shit firm you have. No, we're the best. <laughs> just, shit firm. Yeah, we've got the best firm. <laughs> when, we were, when, you, when we're Luton, we're active, yeah? But yeah, I had yeah, a... Yeah. Um, no, no, no. I had a... So, so, so we could muster numbers, and as a... We were we wouldn't back down yeah, on the, to the Pakistani gangs. And that's just how it was. And, but I also, I had a good relationship with a lot of the Pakistanis when I was okay, growing can up. Can I just say, can I yeah. stop you on something now, right? This is a good point, I think. So, you know, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, there was a term, they would call it Paki bashing. Yeah, we all know it. I know it through my father's, you know, with my father's friends. And, you know, this this was a term used. Oh, when, it was, it was actions used. They were unfairly yeah. targeted. And, and tennis culture would be a part of it and, and the skinheads and the mods. And this this was something. Don't you just look at it in some in some, in some some sort of sense, not karma, but the tables have turned where these people were at one stage, they would cower. And these people who were having trouble with now who were your age, it was their fathers who were probably getting bashed by these, yep. by these groups. And it, it's just a... It's just a tables of turn type of thing where they're not taking the shit no more. Um, no, no. The ta in in a street level, in a street level of just youths clashing. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm just yeah, I'm but, talking about the tension building up. Okay, anyway, yeah. I'm not talking about yeah, raping. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, no, that, that's not justified for that. But I'm just saying of tension anyway. <laughs> yeah, they got the numbers. Yeah, they got the numbers now. And but then, so, but I, as I said, I had a good relationship. All all the, all the main gangs of Luton, the Pakistani gangs, I know them all. I grew up with him. My best mate, um, when I was about 11 years old, his name was Imran Masmat. Rest, rest in peace, He's, he, he died. I couldn't go to his funeral. Yeah. He died. And um, and he, so we, we were best friends, 10, 11, 12 at football. Then his dad died and he went to Pakistan. We met again when he was about 17, when I started going out in the town. And he was one of the main lads in their, in, in their gang scene, in the Pakistan gang scene. So I, I had a good rapport with all of them. I know all of them. Yeah. And I still, and they still shake my hands now, all the Muslim lads. All the, cause, I, and growing up through our football thing, we just, I guess the football scene, we, we went back down over issues, but we had an all right relationship in the end. But, um, but, we, but I also knew the consequence of talking about these issues. I knew what's going to happen. And, um, and most people say, are you the wrong person? I, I say, well, it was never going to be a female school teacher that stood up to Islam in the UK. Yeah. It's only going to be a certain mindset of people and a certain mindset of a man that ain't going to back down. And you've got to take the good with the bad. So because of my upbringing, because of um, my youth, 
then that's what's made me who I am. And that's the reason when I got the first punch in the nose, I didn't back down. Mm. It's the reason if I walk out of here and someone hits me, I'll hit them back. It's the reason for those things. Um, so, yeah. Could you um, paint, a, paint a bit of a picture for the people who are watching who may not have watched the Oxford Union? Just kind of what, what, what your upbringing was like in Newton. So, I, my mum was Irish. Uh, Luton is a Luton is a um, an immigrant town, really. Yeah, white English or minority. Uh, my mum was one of eight come here as the Irish community. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish when they come to Luton. Yeah, um, Luton's football scene has always been diverse, multicultural. So racist elements, say like West Ham or the Millwalls, they'd all Luton was a big day out because half of Luton's football hooligans are black. Yeah, and that's Luton's always been like that. So Luton's always been that. And I always say, line all my friends up. Yeah, you love St. Lucian, um, Bulgarian, Italian, Jamaican. We're all the sons of immigrants. Yeah? And when it comes to multiculturalism, you had Angela Merkel. The David Cameron chose a day to come out and say multiculturalism has failed. And it was a day that we had about five or 10,000 coming to Luton for an EDL demo. Shit timing for him, yeah? Th thick, yeah? But I think he was, I think they were appeasing what was a growing menace probably for them on the streets which was a mass movement of working class men who were hitting towns and cities in large numbers and screaming in anger about what was happening to their country and to their communities now he said multiculturalism failed angela merkel said multiculturalism failed that is a weak cowardice way of saying that islam's failed because if you come to luton it hasn't failed okay it hasn't failed the it, it's like you come into and i explain it from when i went to school you had the muslim playground the non-muslim playground on the non-muslim playground it's not all whites yeah? It's whites, blacks, Indians, Chinese, it's everyone. Yeah? But the Muslims stick together like that. And I never knew, understood why. You go into school dinner, hey, school dinner table. I don't know what it's like when you went to school. You'd have everyone, you'd have everyone in, integrated and sitting yeah, together. It's all mixed, yeah, yeah right. but not in the corner. You'd have 10 stables of Pakistanis. They don't mix. Yeah? That, we haven't done that as kids. It's like oil and water. We didn't do that. Yeah? And I never understood it until I started dissecting the Quran. And I'll challenge anyone to do this. Pick up the Quran. Yeah, someone sent me uh, a Muslim outreach, sent me it when I was first in jail, 2011. I was on 22 weeks on solitary confinement. Yeah. Someone in the prison, like a... No, no, Muslims from outside. You can send things in. Oh, like, right, okay. So they sent me in with a funny little letter saying, hey, Tommy, we thought we'd help you embrace Islam. <laughs> and, um, and thank you guys, because I dissected your book. I had 22 weeks of nothing. So I just sat there and I opened it up and every reference it made, whether it be to women... I've done different categories. Yeah? So take the reference, do not be friends with Christians or Jews. Yeah? And just reference every verse that says it. I had pages. And then it just clicked. I thought, Jesus, man. This Are is you religious? It. No. This, but I thought, this is it. This is the reason. This is everything I've seen growing up. The Islamic ghetto. Yeah, There ain't no black ghetto in Luton. There ain't. Right? Whites and blacks are all comfortably integrated everywhere. How come there's this Islamic ghetto? And the Islamic ghetto and the non-integration, I'd say, comes from the Saudi money, from the Qatari money. It comes from the influence of Wahhabism. It comes from... So I had this deal when I was in jail with when I was younger, 21, I was 21. And I was in jail with some lads from Biggleswade, which is a town. And they've got Muslim lads there in the towns, a few. Where's that based? Biggleswade. It's not far from Luton, yeah? Okay. But they're totally integrated. There's no mosque. Yeah? They're not all in one area. There's no mosque. There's no influence. They're just cultural Muslims. I said, yeah, that's very different to when you've got... For example, the Luton main imam, um, Qadir Basque. Luton's main Islamic centre, mosque. This is what frustrated me for years. I grew up, my, my mate was a Muslim lad. When we were younger, we were driving through the town. He said, that's the one, bruv, that one there. I said, what? He goes, that's the terrorists. Yeah? And it was Luton Islamic centre. So I knew that from within their, within their youth, yeah? They would say, that's the one, bruv. Trust me, they're the ones, yeah? Then I see, Luton, when we started the English Defence League, they set up a Luton in Harmony programme about how that town's in harmony, yeah? which it's not. Who did? The, the, the Muslims council. or the no, council? council? And one of the lead seats on this, on this Luton and Harmony programme was a gentleman called Qadir Basque, who's the imam from Luton Islamic Centre. So I knew from day dot, he's a wrong one, yeah? from my mates telling me. And then I thought, right, I, took, I, I investigated that mosque. I investigated everything about him. I found that they were... So the Stockholm bomber who blew himself up in Stockholm, he came to Luton as an innocent Muslim, went to university. He was radicalised by al Mujradeen, who are now a prescribed terrorist organisation. But they weren't until the English Defence League was formed. They were given free reign to recruit in this country. They were sending people out to fight for the Taliban, sending people to fight against our country. They were in the newspaper bragging about it. No one batted an eyelid. When the English Defence League formed, we challenged them. Yeah? They then got prescribed, okay, because of the tensions it was causing. But they were a terrorist organisation. So he he went out to Stockholm and blew himself up. But he came to Luton as an innocent Muslim from Sweden. He was radicalised, converted at the Islamic Centre, at the Luton Islamic Centre. The Westminster Bridge attack, Khalid, was it Khalid Massoud, that one? And um, 
he worked at that mosque. Yeah? Everything comes back to his mosque. Now, I was sitting, I left the English Fence League in 2015. I'm sat in a room like this in BBC, BBC's local radio uh, in Luton Town Centre. And I know that Kadir was sat on, and someone rang me and said, Kadir, Kadir Bash is being interviewed about you leaving the English Fence League. He's on BBC in Luton. So I went walking in. So I just walked in and they sat there and the bloke says, well, oh, Tony Robinson does live in Luton. He's just walked in. I said, yeah, of course I walked in. Let me sit down and talk to you. Because yeah? I'm the extremist, remember? Everyone calls yeah. me the extremist, yeah? So I sat down and I said, um, Kadir, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Just to, I just want to ask you a few questions. Yeah? I'll answer your questions, you answer mine. And he says, okay. I says, in your ideal society, what would the punishment be for homosexuals? And he just looks. And you can watch this video. He said, I said, would there be a punishment? He says, yes. I said, okay. Because you have to ask the right question in your ideal society. He goes, what he tried to get around was, he goes, no, there'll be no punishment in Britain. You know, there's no punishment in Britain. This is British. I said, no, no, I don't want to know about Britain. I want to know about your ideal society. What you, in your ideal society, would be. Yeah. Yes, homosexuals will be executed. Oh, but you're head of Luton in Harmony. <laughs> How can you have Harmony when you're killed a gays, bruv? How can you have Harmony? Um, I'm the extremist, yeah, because I don't want people wearing a niqab, apparently. That makes me a massive extremist. But you're part of Luton in Harmony. You're a nice, moderate voice. And you want to kill gay people? And, you know, from, from this interview, um, from this interview, Ofsted raided the school because he had a school as part of his mosque. It was all over the news, yeah? Ofsted raided the, the school. They found books in the school library telling them to stone women, telling them to cut hands and feet off. They had, in their books, in the kids' books, yeah? The school was shut down. And I'd battled for years, and I'm sitting there like... And it was... So this happened, and then I was challenging the council all the time, saying, how are you sitting around a table with this man? Yeah, he's a Nazi. He's a, then the Nazi's the millennium, yeah? He is a jihadist. Yeah? And he's, you've got a seat at the table. And whilst you're all sitting at the table, we're out, we're out there, all the working class. And, and Luton, Luton Council asked me for a meeting. This is when we hit off the English Defence League. I went for the meeting. They set up cameras like this. They had about 10 of them. And there was a baroness, a black baroness. There, um, and they said, we want to sit and ask you questions. Yeah? So tell us what your problem is. Because they knew we were resonating with people. I said, okay, I'll tell you the problem. Yeah. Uh, Farley Hill is the most run down, is one of the most deprived estates in this in country. Luton. In Luton, yeah? yeah. One of the most deprived estates. It's a white, white estate, really, yeah? A white council estate. I said, the park is from 1960. Yeah? Well, trot down the road to the Islamic community, you've got a £350,000 state-of-the-art park. You've got a re you're a regeneration area, so your kids don't have to go to play, play, play football, play tennis, or do anything, yeah? We have got to play a five reach. Yeah? You have neglected us. You've forgot us. You've abused us. I said, and, the, and I said, now I'm going to go through and ask you a couple of questions. Audio, where do you live? Yeah, St. Albans. Where do you live? Hitchin. These are all nice areas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> where do you live? Yeah. And I got to Mohammed at the end, who's in there. I said, you live in Berry Park, didn't you? He said, yeah. I said, you represent your community. None of you lot even know who we are. You don't even know what we're, what we're about. You're not from where we're from. You're not brought up where we're brought up. You don't get what we're talking about. You haven't seen the problems we see. So and the problems we see are the problems of Islamic immigration and, how, and integration. And Luton went from when I was born in 1982 to one mosque. We've now got over 40. The culture change. You said 30 on the Oxford. You yeah, that was Oxford. Gonna, that was 2015. So you're saying there's been another 10 yeah. since then. Yeah, and, and, then, and, and, and at what point... No, that's not bad. You know, it's, no, it's it, is, it is a bad thing because what, what mosques are promoting... What mosques are promoting, and this is just the conversation, it's like, is it a bad thing? Was Muhammad a good guy? Was he a good guy? And this is the, and I speak to Muslims and say, look, Muhammad beheaded 600 people in one day. Is he a good guy? Yeah. He married a six-year-old and he shagged her when she was nine. Is he a good guy? He tortured a man and set fire to his stomach and took his gold off him, a bloke called Kanana. This is not a talk according to Tommy Robinson. This is according to all Islamic scripture. Is he a good guy? Yeah. Is he the right guy to, for us to have four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty 10, 20 million people revering as a good guy? No, he's not. He's not. And that is an open discussion that we see. Same should... in the Bible, though. And same... No, it's not. Jesus didn't behead anyone. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't rape anyone. Muhammad, it says four or five times in the Quran, outside of your four wives, take whatever your right arm possesses. The right arm is the arm of the sword. Yeah? It actually says, um, it actually, it, it, it gives, it gives law to taking non-Muslim women as sexual slaves. Now, are we all going to pretend that Rotherham isn't about men taking girls as sexual slaves? It, Rotherham, Telford, Rochdale, Manchester, Oldham, all the, there's a report coming out on the 12th for this month that's going to expose the cover-up in Telford. It's coming out by it's an independent inquiry um, that's been done by a solicitor's firm. It's going to be all the same headlines. Like when you, so it's not, 
it's not hate speech. And I, and again, let's make it clear, yeah? The vast majority of Muslims are not practising this. The vast majority of Muslims I grew up with, they're just living their life and just want to get on. I, was, I had a debate the other day with a Muslim. I said, I bet you have a beard, don't you? You know what I mean? I bet you a gamble. Go into the, let's go into Cardiff afterwards and go into the bookies. I bet it's all Muslim lads. <laughs> who are standing in them. But my point is, majority of lads ain't following the scripture, but there's a problem with the scripture. And we mo- we've got to be able so to... So what do, what, what do you think, in your in your eyes, what is... what do you, How do you solve this? Is it to, like, move with the times? Is that what you're saying? We kind of update scripture? No, is no, that what you're no, trying no. To, we, 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 it's, 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 you're not going to eradicate... Eradicate that, are you? No, no, it's 1,400 years old and it's never changed once and it won't because it's the word of God. But my point is to compare Jesus to Muhammad is just so ridiculous. To compare Christianity to Islam is ridiculous. Islam's leader was a very successful warrior. That's what he was. Yeah? And it's never been called a religion of peace until George W. Bush said it. Everyone's always accepted what Islam is. William Gladstone held the Quran above his head in Parliament and said, this, there will never be peace on earth so long as we have this book. He, he's veneered. He, we've got statues of him across our capital city. He's one of the best leaders this country's ever had. There will never be peace on this earth so long as we have this book. It's a violent and cursed book. Yeah? He didn't say an interpretation of Islam because there was never about an interpretation of Islam. It was just Islam. It was Muhammad. This whole new thing that we're in now where it's all down to interpretation. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. And that's not to say we don't have diff- totally different sects of Islam, some very peaceful sects of Islam. But it's problematic because Qatar and Saudi, the countries who are the biggest funders of Islam in the UK, they're the ones put... If Whoever funds the mosque controls what's being taught in the mosque. Mm. And Qatar is a just a, an embarrassment to human rights, an embarrassment to freedom for women, an embarrassment for homosexuals. They execute them. Yeah? You can't leave Islam in, Qatar, in Saudi Arabia. You can't. You get killed. Yeah? The punishment for leaving Islam... Across the world, the punishment for leaving Islam, according to scripture, is death. Yeah? There's no freedom. I want to. I want to talk about. Um, you you said it's like the it's the Nazi, the, the Nazis of the generation or whatever of the millennium. Sorry, um, questionable members of the EDL, Nazi members. Yeah. What, what, what was that about then? So, when we started the English Defence League, and if we go back, it started from the United People of Luton. And you can, anyone can watch the videos. It was blacks and whites because that's Luton. Yeah. And then we left Luton and we went to Birmingham um, over Alma Jardine and, and Jim Chowdhury's group. People were talking about our tactics. We just followed them. They attacked our troops in Luton. Yeah, they, they spat in our soldiers' faces. That's what started the English Defence League. I set up a group after that to try and protest about it. But before we set up the group, I contacted Luton Council and I set up a petition. And our goal was to have this terrorist group uh, given asbos and banned from the town centre and banned from interacting with each other. Mm. Yeah? Prevent them doing what they're doing. The, the police's reaction was to leave them and they come and nicked us. They went to my house. They nicked 14 of the lads and they gave us all three, four month bail conditions not to enter the town centre. So I thought, so you've done to us what we wanted you to do to, do to them. And um, we're not terror- terrorists. We're just annoyed with these lot mm. who, are, who are promoting hate every day. So, I, and then I watched the video and you can watch, I think I showed it on Oxford Union, didn't I? Um, a young boy called Sean was shopping in Birmingham Centre and these jihadis, which yeah, yeah. the majority of that group, 60% of the terrorists in jail were members of that group. Yeah, They're all now in jail. The one who slapped me through the car window, people would have seen this video. Mm. He's in jail. His name's Sword of Islam for ISIS terrorism. They're all in oh, jail. That was Saif al- Saif al- Islam. Saif yeah. Sword of Islam. That was him, was he? The one who, the one who slapped me, yeah. yeah. It's quite funny, actually. Because <laughs> he slapped me. I'd slap me. If I was a Muslim, I'd slap me. Yeah. yeah? If I was a young... You you only get to see clips of me walking through town when people are aggressive. The vast majority of Muslims are very polite, very nice. I have some great conversations with them. Um, we have some great debates. And they're like, Tommy, I'm, I'm annoyed. I have Muslim come to me. I'm annoyed about it. What can I do? Yeah, there's got to be a way you can... Yeah, and, and, and do you know what? Right. I, I sit here now and I, I talk... I have my view on Islam. Yeah, And my view is a, an educated view on Islam, a, 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 of studying what it is and who Muhammad was. That's not that's not all Muslims. And, what, and now where we're at is, I'm in a mad stage now because I'm looking at the biggest threat to this country and I'm seeing the communist Marxist world movement, yeah, which is growing, whether it be over COVID, um, the globalist elite, the attack on freedom, the forced vac- vaccination, the all. I'm, I'm looking at all of this, thinking, do you know who I think our biggest allies will be to fight this? It's, it's the Muslim community. It's my, it, it's like I've said to loads. I, I said the elite want to take our freedom in the same way they want to take your freedom. Yeah, they want to shove their injections in my kids' arms. To say they want to shove their injections in your kids' arms. The 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 conspiracy of whatever you want to people call it conspiracy of the new world order of the great reset 
of the financial breakdown of everything that's happening now, yeah, Muslims will be our, our allies. And I, I'd march with any Muslims to stop what's going Because I, I looked and I've seen the biggest threat to my hometown growing up in Luton. And then I sit and look at it and think, oh, we've been played. And, and, I'm, I, and I, we've been played. And maybe I played my role in that's totally benefited them because they have made us clash with each other. Yeah. They've brought Islamic immigration in. They've let them get away with crimes. They've played us all against each other. They want you to be, you're gay, you're straight, you're black, you're white, you're separated there, you're separated yeah, there. The labels. The, the labels and they want, they want us all warring with each other. And I've probably played a big role in that. Yeah. In clashing. And then you're just, I, you're just, a, you're just a, you're a piece. We're a poor man. And I sat and looked at it and thought, oh and man. what have you got from it? Apart from jail time and, and death threats. Well, we're all talking about, well, when I say that, like, that's why I don't regret anything because the English Defence League forms here and the rest for the rapes go like that. There was none. It's like this. It's just, like, I've done a graph just to say, yeah. Could, you really maybe think I'm just that stop that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. No, so Andrew Norfolk, I'll send you a speech. I'll give a speech called The Rape of Britain. I give it in Moscow. And I went through all the newspaper reports. And Andrew Norfolk is the journalist who was given the award for highlighting the grooming. And what he says is, I'd heard about these crimes for years. And I was too worried, yeah, because it was white girls, all Pakistani men, yeah. He goes, and then I saw the emergence of the far right and they were screaming it, yeah. And I knew that we had to take this back. So the coward knew what was going on as a journalist. Yeah, wow. He didn't report on it. And then he saw us screaming on the streets and he wants to destroy us as far right extremists because we're talking about it. And then he, the hero, the fucking, the middle class toff, we have to take it back from these animals, yeah? The animals whose daughters are getting raped, yeah? We have to take it back from them. And he openly says that. So he admits, he admits he only reported on it because of the actions of the English Defence League. Now, the English Defence League was good, it was bad, yeah? It played an important role in raising awareness. It played an... Imp and, and marching through the streets was not good. Um, would it have caused information in communities? Yes, would we possibly have helped radicalise Muslims? Yes. That's that. I think, I think you're proud in a bear. Yeah, no, I think, I think in 2015, when I left the English Defence League, I deeply thought about all these things. Yeah. Does it benefit us? Are we giving the extremists something to speak to the youth about? Yeah, saying, look what they're doing. Look, at, look, they hate you. Yeah. Uh, we were coming through in big numbers. Um, and we were marching provocatively. But we were meant to be marching provocatively. We were a pressure group who were trying to... If we'd have just... But we tried it. We signed a petition. They ignored us. Yeah? If we hadn't been the organisation with the momentum we had in the way we had, we'd have never been heard. But then it got to a point where I, I sat in 2015 and thought, we're pretty lucky and no one's been killed. Six of them, five of them went to jail for planning to kill, blow us up, a demo. But no one's been murdered. You see, if someone would have got murdered, vice versa, if Muslims would have beaten English Defence League supporter to death or English Defence League supporters might have been Muslim, it's going. Yeah. It's going, oh, you have to think about that. So, and, and I had two moments of thinking about that. That was one of them. Um, so I left. And I left and I listened to Majid Nawaz. And um, so I used him, he used me, really. Um, oh, I, I've seen some of his speeches. They've been... Majid's good. Yeah. Majid's very good. And Majid is the proof that um, I met a Muslim yesterday or the day before. There's a video of it online. He comes up to me, calls me a racist, called me a hate preacher. Um, and he kept saying, you know who I am. I didn't know who he was. Yeah? I had no idea who he was. And I have a 10 minute... 20 minute talk with him and in the end he was all, he was alright yeah and he says I'm a changed man Tommy I'd... was that yesterday that was uh, two days ago yeah three days ago in Manchester you see yeah. uh, but but who it turned out when I went home and found out he who he was, was beating people he, people. him and his mates in Liverpool were beating up were walking down the street and anyone that was not a Muslim or white they battered yeah and it was a Muslim who stopped them so a Muslim bloke gentleman stopped them battering someone yeah? and he said he thought I thought they're racist their hate was that venom venomous and him, he called me a racist. <laughs> and he talked to me about hate crime. It's like, you're a hypocrite. But I'm so glad now, I'm so glad I didn't find out who he was when I was there because I probably would have stuck it on him. I said, well, I'm white and I'm not Muslim. And you're not with your mates now. But, um, but I'm so glad I didn't because when I watch his video back and I've watched it back a few times, he clearly says he's a changed man. Yeah? And everyone has a right to change. And he could have done those crimes and he might now be a nice guy. And he was a nice guy, actually, because he, cool. he was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, and Majid Nawaz is a prime example of that. Majid was in, terror was in jail for being a member of Hizbut Tahir in Egypt. Uh, Hizbut Tahir are a prescribed terrorist organisation. I knew that. Yeah, Majid, Majid, they got him out. Whether you say it's MI5, some, I might look at it. That he was taken out of jail. He's a, he was a radical. And he was brought back to the UK and then given £600,000 by the Home Office to set up an anti-radical organisation <laughs> called Quillim. And that, the goal of that, that organisation was to 
get Muslims who are being radicalised back on side. It's a battle they lost. And I met with, I met with I, I, when I left the English Defence League, I went and worked for Quilliam. I spent three, four months in their offices just seeing what they're doing, how they're working, how they're trying to... I set a meeting up with all the English Defence League leaders and all Muslim leaders to debate, to discuss, to tell us why you're angry. Do you, like, well, let us tell you why we're angry. And I went to a meeting with um, Tom, Tom Robinson, actually, the Bishop of Pontefract. So this is, I've had some mad meetings over the years. I, I got contacted. So for the Bishop of Pontefract to meet me, I, I guess he's a head bishop and he works for the Queen, yeah? So the meeting was, he set, they set up a meeting when I was leading the English Defence League with two major scholars of Islam who, one of them pro, preaches at the Golden Dome I've Mosque in Jerusalem, well. yeah? No, we did, no, this, this was a secret meeting. Oh, right, okay. I've um, seen one where you meet two scholars and they're talking about... The underage puberty. Oh that, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, yeah, that he worked. For, yeah. yeah, no, no. This one was a secret meeting, and it was held in church facilities okay. in Ox in uh in Derby, yeah. Derbyshire. And when I walked in, the bishops there, another leading priest is there, and then these Muslim scholars are all here. You know, these these really influential. They believe they are Diabandi Muslims, and the church said to us, "We believe these are the future leaders of this country, yeah? this sect of Islam. Yeah, these are the growing numbers. These men will be the the leaders." We want you to discuss with them. Yeah, you've got a free room. So I'm like, all right. So I just walked in and said, "Well, you're taking a piss." I looked them up. I said, "You're absolutely taking a piss." Yeah. I said, and I went in. I went into them just politely. But I said, "This is what we're pissed off about." Yeah. <laughs> and the church leads there, and they said, "The church leader said we held a joint Christmas uh, multiculturalism day with the with these leaders. We're trying to bring integration. We've done this." I said, "Okay." And did your Christmas lunch involve wine? And he looked. I said, "Or well, was it Sharia compliant?" You held a Sharia compliant lunch because they're Muslim. Yeah? You bend, they didn't. That's that's what this is about. They don't bend at all. We keep bending. Yeah. Yeah? And we're not prepared to bend any longer. I said, I said, I, I'm willing to. I, I think you you will only really get success if you bring us, the kids on the street, the, the English kids, uh, and the non-Muslims with the young gang lads or the young Muslim lads. Yeah? If you want to bring people together, that's who you need to bring together because I'm sorry, but you sitting as a priest and you sit as an imam and you sitting having a photo taken twice a year for diversity ain't doing ain't doing nothing yeah and i sat down and laid into these two lads politely just said this is what we're fed up about it's all about the girls the rapes the non integration the 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 heroin it was all about all of it yeah and then that, the bloke sat and said tommy man he goes do you know how refreshing it is to actually hear why people are upset because we don't hear none of this from them i said no of course you don't they're just sitting having their photo taken telling everything's great when it's not great it's not so let's accept it it's not great in any town and city the islamic community are not integrated in any town and city yeah and that's a problem. And if you want to solve it, we've got to talk about it. And you've got to, and to talk about it, you're going to have to stamp, stamp on some toes. We're all worried about, I said, you keep, you're treading on eggshells. It's time to just start jumping on feet because the country's a mess. And right now, with, whether you want to call it 40,000 Muslims on a terrorist watch list, when you look at all, when the bombs are all going off, like it's only because our security services, if we didn't stop the attacks, we'd have had one terrorist attack every month, yeah, for every year, literally. Planes, nightclubs, everything, yeah. Then you'd realise we're in a war zone. But you don't realise we're in a war zone because we keep stopping them. But the reality is, if we've got 40,000 now on a terrorist watch list, yeah, I believe it's the top 3,000, 3,000 are on 24 hours a day, seven days a week monitoring, £9 billion a year. £9 billion a year to monitor these scumbags. Yeah? Intern them. Intern them. You intern the IRA, intern them. You're at war. Do you know in that top 3,000, Salman Abadi, who done the terrorist attack in Manchester, it wasn't in the top 3,000, Michael Adebalajo. I made a video on Michael Adebalajo in 2010. I put a video up of who he was when I was running the English Defence League. He wasn't in the top 3,000. The ones who went on the Westminster Bridge attack weren't in the top 3,000. So what do you think the ones in the top 3,000 are like? Yeah? None of these ones are in the top 3,000. And it's like, what, are you just waiting for a blast up? Now, we are at war. If you accept we're at war, the enemy, when it was Nazi Germany, you weren't allowed the Nazis to be promoting and walking around the streets. So just get rid of them. That's what I said. Everyone's had enough of them. Like if you've got, if you've got, if they're flying in now and they're part of prescribed terrorist organisations or a link with them, then get rid of them. But yeah, we had the meeting with the Muslim lads and um, come out of the meeting, it was the Bishop of Pontefract and I just said, you keep bending. Stop bending. Stop bending on your belief for their belief. You should have had a Christmas lunch and if they're willing to sit with you, you could have drunk wine if you wanted, because we, we know you wanted to. So it's like you keep giving and everything's got to be Sharia compliant. That ain't integration. What's nationalism to you? I think nationalism is a pride in... So I think what they want to destroy... So there's an attack on nationalism. Yeah? And nationalism, they're trying to make a terrible word. Yeah? 
to break down our countries and to break down our society and to get us all into one group that they want, yeah, you have to break down the identity and you have to break down your history. So someone who doesn't know who they are, where they come from, or their history, or their belief, or the pride in their history, it will not be bothered about defending it. Um, and I believe that's a sustained attack that's happened. And I don't think there's anything wrong with nationalism. I think we need more nationalism. I think that um, every child, I think America's more successful on this. Whether it be because... Patriots and... Even the... Even the so they make everyone swear allegiance to the Stars and Stripes of the United States. It would be great if every school in this country was proud of the British flag and flying the British flag. And that, and when I say every school, I, don't, I mean Muslim kids should be brought in up. You're not going to... So long as you keep... Well, we're Pakistani, yeah? Because you can stop... I've got third-generation Pakistani lads, I know. And they class themselves as Pakistani. It's like... Is it going to be fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth? Because my mum's Irish, yeah? My mum's Irish, come here as an immigrant. I'm English, okay? Mm. I'm English. And, I'm as he, and, that, and, and that's the same for each one of the sons of migrants. And I've heard this whole debate. I just think that unless nationalism should be encouraged, should be encouraged, and there's nothing wrong with it, and they want to break that down, and Black Lives Matter, as to, you know, you're on about regrets. That was another regret I have, actually. Do you need a work uniform? Want to start a clothing brand? Or maybe you have a football kit that needs a logo printed. Well, if I was you, I'd get in touch with the Reinspire Printing Company down Traforest Industrial Estate for the finest printing and embroidery in Wales. I use them for my custom-made mankini, but you could use them for T-shirts, hats, hoodies, and many, many other things. Go on. Um, Black Lives Matter blew up, didn't it? I, man, this, it was, this is probably the most difficult period of my life when I come out against Black Lives Matter. And you know, I actually looked and thought, geez, the Muslims take it pretty good. Because um, I've said a lot and I've battled against Islam for 10, 15 years. And then I started looking at it very differently because I thought, I see Muslims every day. Yeah? You only see a couple of instances where I get a punch in the nose. That's, uh, they're pretty cool with it, with my criticism. And I didn't used to think they was. But when I went to come out against Black Lives Matter, damn, it blew up for me. It was the, it was the moment, it was the, they had the, the George Floyd death and the, the passion and the emotion. You've always screamed about not being racist. Yeah, and yeah. And just, you know, it's religious tension, yep. it's not racial tension. So if you go against BLM, it's going to look like you are more of yeah, a racist. It shouldn't, because BLM as an organisation, yeah, most people, I said to my mates, because I fell out with a lot of my mates from school, I said, what, you think BLM just formed over George Floyd? Been going ten years. Yeah? It formed. It, it created over a lie. BL, if you and this is where BLM is part of the same. It's all the same movement. Yeah, George Soros funded. Antifa. And it's all the same. Okay, just rebranded. Very genius branding by Soros on BLM because putting the word black in it means you can't criticize it because most black people think you're talking about them. Very clever. Yeah, because it's the same. Right. You go on their website. Not my website. Black Lives Matter website from the United States. The organization that everyone was marching under the banner of. It says. We must destroy uh, the concept of the nuclear family. You want to get rid of mums and dads. Now, in the 1960s, 80% of black children in the United States live with their mum and dad. Now it's 20%. What does that do? What does it do by breaking up the family? It brings poverty. It brings crime. It makes black, pe black children like 100 times more likely to end up in prison because the, they haven't got a father figure. Who fills the role of the father figure? The gangs, the rap gangs, the culture that's being bred. And actively, this is the tarp. This is what they are calling for, Black Lives Matter. You should be calling for families. Family, you should be encouraging families to stay together. You need a father figure in your life. Yeah, yeah the stats are shocking. Or, uh, Insane uh, stats stands, of yeah. what happens when you don't have a father. Single parents. Single yeah, parents. No father. And yet that's the goal of... So the two women who set up Black Lives Matter are both Marxists. How is that any? How is it any positivity in that for blacks? No, there's no not. I'm just see, I'm thinking of, of of the slogan. Is that definitely on there? Is it million percent? Yeah, the the, the list. Yeah, promote we'll LGBT promote LGBTQ plus narrative. What's that got to do with Black Lives? Yeah? Mm. The whole thing is about destroying the family. The targeting of the family. To, it is about keeping blacks at the bottom. Yeah, and that's what's happened. And the Democrats are the party that have done that. They have kept, they don't want blacks succeeding. They don't want them to. They want them reliant on the state. This is about keeping a entire community of vote base who are reliant on the state, who don't see success, who don't see that they can be successful. They, they see that racism is to blame for everything when it's not. Right? And what, what I said, so when I went, I went on this rant and it was how I delivered it. 
And it is the biggest regret because it caused my children so much upset because the circles I move in are white and black. I, I at school was the white boy of all the black boys. Yeah? My son's the same now. Okay. So all his friends, my daughter's friends, and they're the kids I welcomed into my, I love them all. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, but when I went on rant about Black Lives Matter, everyone, because of the way it was clipped and rappers, and it went so viral, yeah, some funny videos, but which were mocking me, but it, it went viral because what I'd done is I watched the War Memorial get smashed up in London and it was the Commonwealth War Memorial and it was under the, and it was Black Lives Matter demonstration. They spray painted all over it and then they attacked Wir Ch Churchill statue. So then I made a video saying, right, next Saturday, every football hooligan in the country is coming. You're not smashing up our War Memorials. Yeah? And I said, our War Memorials. Yeah. And, and then and then people took that is this when it was all the statue taking of like the, the slave trade yeah that type of stuff was yeah it? it was at that time when everything was being smashed up and they were talking about ripping down Churchill and um and then they smashed up a war memorial and they spray painted all over it and I remember getting so wound up and, and you know, I'll tell you the truth what it was I'd been up in Barrow filming for a documentary and this is a, and this will be a surprise so there was a claim of a girl being groomed in Barrow by Pakistani Muslim men who own businesses. I went up there, spent two weeks in the town. Yeah. Um, I want to tell the truth each time. Yeah. I believe the men have been wrong, wrongfully accused. That's what I believe. Yeah? That's what you believe. I believe. You I, think it, I believe. That's refreshing for you. I believe that, and I went to one man's business. He's owned the business for 40 years. And a white lad turned up with him who moved out there from London he goes Tommy I, I watch everything you do I wouldn't be standing here with this man yeah, if I thought he was a wrong one he goes I know him since this big and he went and we went through it but then I looked at the girl and there's a lot that people don't know about this case and it's going on in Barrow and um, and I'd gone and I'd gone to the Muslim's house the main man who was accused uh, and his, his missus come out the back and she goes what are you doing here I goes I'd like to speak to your partner I said look I'm seeing a lot of discrepancies, yeah, in what I'm hearing. I just want to meet your partner. She says, let me ring him. And, and then he rang me. He goes, yeah, Tommy, come around my house. And, and it's funny because as I get out of the car, I get out of the car and some, someone shouts, you fucking racist, yeah? And he comes out of his house and some woman shouts, you paedophile, at him. And I, I look, I'm getting called a racist. He's getting called a paedophile. You know. I said, I won that one. <laughs> but then he says, come in. And I went in and I, uh, his son was sat there. He's 15. He's had to leave college. Um... And there's so many discrepancies in, basically, the girl who's made these claims has previously lied about other men. Now, because these claims might fit the narrative for certain people, it does not, it, it, if what she is saying cannot be trusted, a man was previously put in jail wrongfully for a false claim of rape. Yeah, it's not good. Now you're destroying these men's names and they and off the basis of what? If there's evidence, there's evidence, but the minute there's no evidence, and their lives are destroyed. Now I want, so I was telling that story, and I said to the man, I said, "Listen," and I was look, and I was at his house. I was trying to find her dad. Her dad, yeah. They wouldn't meet with me. They were coming out to get labour. Her mum, her nan was in charge of social services. Her mum's a counsellor for labour. Um, and then my mate's following him and goes, "Right, I found him. He's in the cup." We, we said, so, "He go." So I said to the Muslim lad, "I've got to go." Because I need to ask the dad's sake. Because this is all coming out and, and no one in the town or no one in the British public is being told the truth. Yeah, The truth is this girl was falsely made accusations and falsified evidence against other men. Yeah, That's the truth. The dad knows the truth. So I went to find the dad and said, when are you going to tell the truth? Because the town's about to blow. Yeah, I mean, thousands are out on the street. It was the start of COVID. There was cars everywhere doing massive, massive parades. Everyone thinks I'm there to... I see all the media saying I'm there to inflame it. I'm just there to tell the truth. And if the mm -hmm. truth if the truth ain't, ain't the, is the truth, then I want to be the person that clears the men's name if, it, if, mm -hmm. if it's right. And I sat and I'm, I thought, I don't think he's done anything. But, but the police come out and said, there's no grooming in this town. I then get contacted by a Muslim, another Muslim, whose relative is, is grooming. And he comes and tells me everything. He said, no, there is grooming in this town. Yeah? But it's not those men. It's, it's such a... It, so I'm investigating all that and I'm sitting there and I, I interview the dad and some bloke, lad pulls up on his bike and he goes, you fucking racist. I went, all right, mate, well done. I said, look, what are you here to do? And he just went, spat straight in my face. And I punch him a couple of times and he's on his ass, and, um, and I punch him and I get back in the car and I turn up to the Muslim's house. Back, I will go back to the Muslim fella's house and he was really... And, and his kid... And, and I felt so much heartache for his son because I've got a son who's, I feel I'm wrongfully accused of being a racist, yeah? And my children have to bear the brunt of that. That's nothing compared to being accused of being a paedophile. 
And I'd say the, the bloke was out, out a lot, yeah. He's a bit of a lad, and but that doesn't mean he's a rapist or a child trafficker. And um, yeah. and at that time, so I'm sitting there, and the and the police sirens were outside. And I, I get in, I say, mate, you ain't gonna believe what's happened. He said, well, I said, I just punched some bloke up in the car park. He just spat my face out there. And, it, and then the police are all outside. And then my mate rings me and goes, mate, police just around the vehicle. And I'm, I'm laughing. It's great footage when this doc, when the film, I'm laughing. And I'm not. He goes, mate, they're going to smash the windows. And I look out and then the Muslim fella said, Tommy, come out the back door. I'll put you in my boot. We'll get out of here. <laughs> and he, he's offering to take me out of there. I'm not, I'm, and then the cameraman says, and the cameraman I got, it was his first day at work. So we're sat there and he's sitting there and I said, uh, have you ever been nicked before? And he's white. And the Muslim fella takes his camera and turns, uh, turns the camera around on him. And I'm, he's got it absolutely white, yeah? I said, welcome to the team, bruv, because it, it was his first day of working for us. And from that, so he, he, he has the SIM card. He goes, should I delete the footage? Because the footage shows the bloke come up to me, spit in my face, yeah? I said, no, don't delete the footage. Give me the card. So I took the card. I took the, the, the card and I hid it somewhere where they wouldn't find it. Right, I get arrested. In interview, they say that I called him a non-binary cunt. That's what he says. So I'm nicked on a hate crime. He's got a broken leg. I'm on GBH. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on a GBH hate crime. I'm thinking, well, I didn't break his leg. Yeah. I did punch him a couple of times. I punched him. When he went down, I didn't hit him again. Yeah. Um, but he'd come up and spat in my face. He'd assaulted me. I get home. Um, I'm released on bail. And I think it's sound because I've got the evidence on here. Yeah. And I get in and uh, I ring someone to come plug the thing in. We plug it in the computer and it's blank. Mate, he's deleted it. I walk out and on the news is Black Lives Matter. And this is the truth, yeah? And I'm ready to lose it, yeah? Because I'm thinking I'm now on a hate crime, a, a, a homophobic hate crime, and, I've bro and a man's got a broken leg. And the evidence I had that he spat in my face and the evidence that I didn't go over the top on him and I didn't say he's non-binary, um, it's all gone. It's deleted. And that's when. And then I went on a rant about Black Lives Matter. And, and I went, ah. And, I, and, and the way I addressed it, and it, not what I said, because what I said was true. But that's that moment. And then um, and I actually managed then, I took, took it to a forensic re uh, recovery place and I got the footage and then it proved what he said was a lie. And uh, I didn't get charged on that. But at that time, that's when I went on a rant about Black Lives Matter. And once I'd done it, it just went bigger and bigger each day. And then we had the demonstration where all the, all the lads were going to protect the war memorials. And then I absolutely shit myself. Yeah. Because I thought someone was going to get killed in London and it's on my head. Um, and it's on my head. And at that point, it looked like I was against blacks because of the, because talking about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter as an organisation is, is, has got nothing to do with black people. Yeah? It's not benefiting black people. It's not created to benefit black people. It's created to cause division and it happens every time there's election in the United States. They come to prominence every time because they want the blacks angry, they want them upset and they want them voting Democrat. Mm -hmm. They don't want them succeeding. Some people say about plantations. I say, you're still on plantations. You're on the Democrats' plantations. You're still stuck down the bottom and they're breaking your family and their Planned Parenthood and everything they're doing to you. They don't want you to be educated. They don't want you succeeding. And um, yeah, and that was Black Lives Matter. And then I, and I, I can't help myself. So I, I fell out with some of my best friends that I've been friends with since this big over that. And I go in my group chat. We're all in a school group chat. And every I, I'm pro, I am bitter about it. I go in there and I, I continually just drop things in there. Um, because I was proven, I feel I've been proven right. Because a year later, was it Kieran Dyer? Um, black footballers started coming out against Black Lives Matter. Because yeah? no, they, yeah, right. they see what it was. And I get wound up about, I think that getting on the knees at an England game, yeah, and then the whole stadium is booing. Well, you haven't done any good. Yeah, You've already got kick it out. You've already got stand up. What, what is getting on your knees? What, what, is, what is getting on your knees? It's a symbol of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter as an organisation is a Marxist organisation. Yeah, Anyone who researches what that organisation is, is against it. But... The symbol, so I had my mate saying, yeah, but yeah, but I just agree with the sentiment of Black Lives Matter. I said, so do I, yeah? But the Ku Klux Klan, right? They, they're, they're racist. Black Lives Matter in America is racist. They kill 30 people now, yeah? About eight of them are black. No, you don't know their names. You know George Floyd's name. You don't know the black people. A black retired police officer who tried to stop them looting shops, they kicked him to death. Watch the video of it, yeah? What's his name? Why don't you know his name? He was a great representative of the black community. A hero, actually. You don't know his name, but you're all glorifying George Floyd, who stuck a, who stuck a gun in a pregnant woman's belly and robbed her. Yeah? He was a drug addict criminal. I said, but you're all glorifying him. I said, when, in, and in the whole, where it's gone now, I look at Gareth Southgate's football team and you're all getting on your knees and you're going to take our football club out and playing guitar, are you? Where 6,000 people have died building those stadiums. 6,000 have died. Slaves. There's still slavery now. Yeah? And what are you going to do about it?
Are you going to wear your rainbow armband in Qatar? No, you're not. Right? You're not. It's totally factual. Yeah? You take our team to that country, that shithole, that Sharia-driven shithole, because yeah? that's what it is, where, you, where homosexuals are executed, where women are oppressed, where if a woman is raped, she needs four male witnesses to witness that rape, or she gets punished for adultery. You, you want to talk about slavery when thousands of people have died building those football stadiums. You want to talk about slavery, it's happening now in Libya. Black people are in cages being sold. Look what happened in Morocco. I've seen that video, yeah. With the refugees. Yeah, but no one, no, no one watching this will know about that video. Yeah, that's the reality. Because in that video, it's Moroccans who killed loads. Yeah, lots of them, and it's the most disgusting video. You got to see the video. These are men and women laying there, many of them motionless, dead or dying. Yeah, and they're in cages. And that's two weeks ago, or weeks ago. Yeah, but Ukraine is, you know, well, Ukraine's a major news for. But it's like it's like black people are. When, when all those girls were taken in Nigeria by Boko Haram and they were kidnapped, if you don't believe that if that was white girls, yeah, the military would have gone in and gone. America knew where they were. They come out straight away. America knew where those girls were. They knew where Boko Haram had them. But no one cared. No one, they didn't care. They didn't care. So I get wound up, so even with my mates, so I say, because I do care about black people. Yeah? I went to, when I made, because I love them, because I've grown up with them. Yeah? I don't see any difference between the colour of people. Yeah? I talk about ideology. Yeah? Black Lives Matter is not for black people. And the sooner people realise that, the better. It's causing more friction and division in this country than there's ever been. Yeah? Getting on your knees at football, which is, if you want to make a symbol, I saw some football teams start coming out and holding, holding arms. Great. But getting down on one knee is a sign of Marx, that Marxist ideology and, and that Marxist organisation in the United States. And you're total hypocrites because you're going to take our club out, you're going to play in the country, it's still our slaves now. Yeah? You're talking about historic, his, historical things. What about now? Blacks are still slaves now. In Saudi Arabia, in many countries, treated like slaves, second-class citizens. So it frustrates me, man. And, and I think it gets frustrates me more because I fell out with some people that I loved uh, over it. And I think, I think, I was, I, I think that they... Do you know what? The way my mother mate said it, he goes, Jack, do you know how much trouble we've took for you? Yeah. Because everyone always says he's a racist. And we've always said, no, he's not. Yeah. And we've argued and argued and argued. And when, when, when you've gone on this run against Black Lives Matter, everyone's just like, see? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it. But um, look, mm. it's, I, I can. <laughs> you've had a mad, mad couple of years, haven't you? Mad 15 years, yeah. How is your mental health, you know, through all this? How is your mental health? No one really talks about your mental health. Addictions. You know, you, you know, there's, there's, there's been reports out there. Talk to me. You know, I'm an ex-addict myself. I can see the signs. Yeah, I'm not allowed... No, I'm, um, it's, certain people are allowed to have mental health. I'm not. Yeah? That's how it is. It's like... It's like... I done a video the other day when I realised about it. In a seven-day period, I had Muslims turn up at my mum's house. They turned up at another lady's house looking for me, four of them. Um... They said they, were, they rang me up. I got the video recordings. They said they're going to kidnap my daughters from school. They're going to drug them. They're going to rape them. Um, These are, this, is, this is the Telford gang I've been investigating. Oh, okay. Please don't do anything about it. Um, so I've had, and sometimes I don't think about it, but, the, and, and do you know when I really did think about it? So I, I just plough through. And I, I, I'll be honest, I, th I always thought it was weak to talk about it, and that as men, you should just carry on and crack on and that's how and then and then I realised so I had a court case I've had a court case I'm, I'm waiting to court now on the 1st of August I've not had one clear period where I haven't had court cases for, since I started the English Defence League in 2009 yeah. I had a court case at the High Court of London uh, for a civil case where I lost and they've, they've hit me for nearly a million pounds now when I come out of that court case, I represented myself because I couldn't afford to pay the hundred thousand pounds that they wanted for the legal representation because I don't get no legal aid so I represent myself and I come out of that court case and my head was about a bang. Yeah. I feel, I, I don't feel I'm under attack. I'm under attack from everywhere. Yeah. My biggest fear is a Muslim walking up to me, killing me in the street. It's not, that's not my biggest fear. I don't fear that. Yeah? My biggest fear is the establishment and what they're doing and what they're planning next. And the games they've played with imprisonment, with moving me. Like, they put me on, they put me on 22 weeks solitary confinement, but you're not allowed to. You're only allowed to do four weeks because it messes with mental health. So after four weeks, they moved me from Wandsworth Prison to Bedford Prison, straight down the block. To start it again. Bedford, Woodhill. Woodhill, Wandsworth. Wandsworth, Wayland. Yeah? And all the games they play in the, same, in, in the same period. And then the fear, I guess it all comes from fear. Because if I said I did, I was terrified when I go to jail. Yeah? but I won't back down from, I won't say I don't need protection because I'm not going with no nonsense. I've, I've done nothing wrong. Yeah. I'm terrified when I, I've been terrified lots of times. Yeah. 
and more terrifying because I think, think deeply about things is the consequence to my family and my children and what I put them through. And um, so all those things, and whether you, I don't know if I realised the effect it has or the weight it carries. And I went to a, when I come out, I, I had this court case and I go on a bender, yeah? I have done for years. Um, I don't, I didn't see as, I don't see as I had an, had an addiction because if I want to go two weeks, three weeks or four weeks without going on a bender, I'll go those weeks without going on a bender. But I'll always go back on the bender. Yeah? And when I say on a bender, when I hit the drink, I don't drink out of enjoyment. I drink in as much as I can, as quick as I can, as fast as I can. And it's more like, I don't know how you describe it, whether it's a form of self-harm. I said, looking at it, you're fucking just ruining yourself for those. and Or, or whether it's called escapism. Whether I look at it and think of it as escaping, I'm trying to escape the reality of who I am and what my fate, what my life is or what my consequence of my belief is. Or what or maybe I'm maybe for that period, for that period when you're on a bender, whether it be 12 hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours, for that period, that's gone. Are you sniffing as well? I was, yeah. I was. Um I was if I go on a bender. Um Do you ever have a pipe? Nah, never. I've never touched anything like that. Nah. Nah. Just recreational and, and, and but then it's like that takes you, and I didn't realise it takes you, yeah? So I come out, it's, it's COVID, I finished this court case. Um, my house, when I was out of the country, people were sent, and this is all organised, yeah? Shamina Begnum's lawyer handed over live on... So my, I receive, the police come to the house, I'm sat with my wife, and the police come to the house and they say, we have an Osman warning. And an Osman warning is a warning that's given to you by the British government to say that we have in, that they have in, intel that someone's going to kill you. Yeah? So they come, I've had six of them. They come and they give me one with a wife and they said, the intel is a group called Antifa have armed themselves with weapons, with firearms. They are planning on burning your house. They're planning on killing you. Yeah? So I said, okay, four weeks later. So I, I put that online. Yeah, I put the video over online. The first person to comment is a bloke called Mohammed uh, Mohammed Akunji. He's the lawyer for Shamina Begnum. He's the lawyer for Michael Adabalajo. He's every terrorist lawyer. Yeah. He makes a comment under that Osman one. So he knows there's a threat to our life from Antifa. What does he go and do? He goes and hires an Antifa activist. Yeah? And it, they sit with cameras like this. I'll, I'll send you the video. They hand him my children's address. They know I'm, they comment. They know I'm in Latvia. Yeah. I land back off the plane. I've got a message from my dad saying, Dad, please help. There's people here. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? And they've gone and live streamed where my kids are. Yeah? They've given the name of the road, the location. My kids had to leave their house that day. Later that night, the Antifa activist made a video saying, Tommy, and I, I'll, send, I'll send you this. Tommy, I'm going to mince your kids. All right? It's going to kill my kids. All of these things are going on. Now, this is all an effect. Yeah, All has an effect. The pressure of it. This is where it gets dark for me. I come out. the next. So first thing I do when I get home, is I think, I find out everything about the man. Who's come to my house? Where's he live? Um, I had two security officers who had made their way up in the EDL, from the EDL and they were close to me. I don't know them, yeah, but they were helping me with security. One of them was rang me up and said, do you want us to light him up? I've gone, no, I don't. And straight away, I thought, I, I don't, and then my friends have come round because, and people have come round wanting to do something to this man who's threatening to kill my kids. I said, no, thank God I said no, yeah? Because the next day I've seen a Mercedes van around the side. I've got a video of this, yeah? I've seen a van, so I pull up next to it and the bloke looks at me and he looks at his mate and he looks back at me and he goes, all right, Tommy. And I just went, all right, Tommy. I said, who the fuck are you? He went, what? I said, who the fuck are you and what are you doing here? He goes, we're just on our lunch break. I said, what do you do for a job? He goes, I'm a plumber, mate. I said, so which house are you working in? Point to me which house you're working in. And he just looks and he goes to start his car. So I jump out of the car and stand in front of the car. I said, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah? He goes, put the phone down, Tommy, put the phone down. You can say, I'll send you this video. So I, I put the phone down. And I said, who are you guys? He says, we're police. I said, right, what, what are you doing? Yeah? They've got a whole listening, fuck, the whole van full of listening stuff at the side of my house. They're sat around the back. So I believe what I was, I believe this was planned provocation for me to conspire to hurt him. The minute I'd have made a comment, I'd be on a conspiracy charge. That's what I believe. Now, I am a paranoid and I've been driven to paranoia. And what I believe, and, and some of this stuff, and I've been targeted, I've, I'm putting a documentary out this week, which is going to expose a lot of this. It's going to expose that groups who work with the British government have come to people, they've blackmailed them, yeah? They've paid them tens of thousands of pounds and they create a source of information. That source of information then says something and the media run it around the world, yeah? But I've got the proof that five or six of these sources of information have been created. You know Johnny there? Like he's yeah. uh, he's in it. He's in, yeah, well, I've got a phone call from him that's what I've recorded, yeah? Because he he clarifies. This certain woman got £20,000. Then she appears on Panorama, lying. Yeah? But I've got all the proof of that. So I've all the paranoia of what they're doing and how they... I know they want to lock me up. 
And I, I know I'd done three months, five months, and another four months of solitary confinement. And I know the adverse effect that had on me. It, it absolutely destroyed me. I went into jail one person, come out another person. It's insane. I come out a totally different person. And I didn't realise it though, yeah? I didn't realise, I did realise it. I had issues, but, um, but a lot of those issues then. So only then, so I, I needed a break from life. And I come out of jail and I don't feel, if I walk down the street, everywhere I walk, I'm like, I have to be ready to have a fight. And I don't, it's not a nice feeling. I'm not, when I go into jail, I have to become a different person than I am. I have to be ready for violence. Yeah? And I have to psych myself up to be horrible, to be a horrible man. Yeah? So I have all this. I come out, I come out of this court case and I feel like I'm cracking up. Yeah? And I booked myself in for 28 days. Um, and in all honesty, for a break. So when I, I went to a re rehabilitation facility where they give intense therapy, and um, and I sat there, and for the first few days I was thinking, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and I was and I was seeing the different people were on heroin. I've never touched heroin. I was looking down at people on heroin, or I would have used to look down on people on heroin. I was listening to some people were alcoholics, some people were mega successful, and then when they said, why are you here? I said, I'm here for a break. And they were like, what? I said. I'm here for a break, mate. Like, I just... Could they take your phone, yeah? I willingly went, yeah? I wanted to book myself in. I said, I'm here for a break. And I didn't see that I had an addiction, yeah? At all. I'd have argued with anyone that I haven't got an addiction. Because if I don't want to drink or I didn't want to do drugs, I'd never do drugs. And that's what I felt, yeah? But then I started listening to people talking. I was thinking, yeah, my... I've, I say that. Yeah. My, my wife said that to me. And I started thinking, Jesus, man. And then I started thinking about the adverse effect. And I always live my life by don't, no surrender. I don't have a good time when I drink or if I go on a sesh. I have a terrible time. I'm terrified. I'm, 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 I'm not having a good time ever. But then I still do it again two weeks later. It's mad. And then I, the, the insanity of telling myself that it'll be different this time. It'll be, it'll be different this time. And it's not. Ever. Yeah. So understanding that, and then I spoke, so I'm sat around in this room and they, and then for the first time in 15 years or whatever, I'm speaking about my fears and what's your fear. And then you write, and you go in depth. You have to write out lots of stuff, effects you've had on family. What would you say to your son at this time? And it gets so deep. Yeah. It was such a best beneficial experience for me and a fascinating experience. I get passionate. I sat there and go, I sat there thinking, I live my life by no surrender. And then I realised that every time I touch a drink or get on a sesh, I'm surrendering. And what am I surrendering to? Because I'm trying to escape who I am, which I can't. I'm trying to run away from my life, which I can't. I still, after 13 years, haven't accepted the reality of, who my, who, of what my life is. And that's what I'm probably always trying to escape. But the negative impact I'm having on my children, the negative impact I'm having on my family... Um, is created from this. And then I sat around listening to some of the, I met some of the most wonderful people I've ever, ever met in my life. Whether there was a, a girl hooked on heroin, beautiful girl, lovely life, lovely, a, a horrific story of her life. Because you have to write out all the trauma in your life. I've seen a lot of trauma. I've had a lot of trauma. And you're trying to work out what your trigger moments is. I don't, mine isn't that. Mine is what's ahead. Mm. That's what my thing is. I'm, I'm scared of what's coming in my life. And not just what's coming for me, but what's coming for my kids. Because I believe I've been targeted. Will my kids get a job? I don't think they will. Are they going to get a job in any big company? I can't get a bank account. Every bank's closed me down. Five banks closed me down. They didn't just close my down, they closed my dad down. Um, so my, it's, it, and it comes from fear with me and I realise that. But it was the first time and I sat and when I spoke in a group, there's 20 people, I cried my eyes out from start to finish every time I spoke. It was insane. But I felt great afterwards. And the first thing I done when that happened is I, I said to the counsellor, dude, I said, I need to bring home. I need to get my son a counsellor. Oh, don't, man. Oh, wow, mate, fucking hell. No, listen, it, it affects everyone. Well, it affects I always everyone. say, I, I'm, I think men are meant to be strong or be tough. So I say, to my, I, I didn't realise, my son watched me um, in, where was we? We was in Hitchin. There's a video, I'll send you it. I'm driving in my car, and my son and his mate, I see some black lad with his hood up, two other Asian lads, and he goes up, it's start of COVID, and he coughs in this old woman's face. And I thought, did I just actually see that? I'm looking in my mirror, because I'm waiting to get out of the junction. So I opened up my door. I said, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah? And he was doing it so purposely in her face. And then they turned around to me. Uh, uh, and I said, what the fuck? He's given her a, bit, and he gave her a big black eye. He, was, was, he gets 22 weeks in jail. But I'm watching it. And I said, what the fuck are you doing, bruv? Right? And then they turn their attention to me. And they say, oh, don't you fucking racist. I say, shut up. And, and then one of them sm smacks me in the car. I get back in my car. 
my son's there. My son's video is in it. Video in it. The video goes viral everywhere. I'll get back in my car. I don't think of this. I'll get back in the car and I'm ready to drive off and I just lose the head and I jump back out of the car and start fighting them all. And then um, I never thought of the effect that would have on a, on a child yeah. of my son. Because I say to my son, you need to, I sort of like, you need to be ready because life's not good. You need to under, You need to be, you need to defend yourself at all times, yeah? Because he's having to be born into this environment that probably I've created through my belief. And then, uh, so for, that happens. And then we go to Spain. No, that happens. Then I go out, then I talk about Black Lives Matter and they come and petrol bomb the car. So the car's blown up. We've got no hotels are open at the start of COVID. We fly to Croatia. We've got nowhere to live. We fly to Croatia. From Croatia, I fly to Marbella. My friend put me up in Marbella in a place. I'm in Marbella. I go to a restaurant with my kids. And this video goes viral as well. So I'm sat there. There's about eight Asian lads over here. So I go in the toilet twice. Because I think if any of them got a problem, come in the toilet and say something to me. I've got my kids with me. I had five kids with me because I'm my daughter's friend. I go into the toilet. They don't come in. I sit back down. At the end, he comes over. I stick fucking holes in you. Yeah, This scumbag. I tried to find him. He, go, he, go, he says, I'll stick holes in you. Um, and, it, and I say, I'm with my fucking kids. And he goes, fuck your kids. And my kids sitting there. They start crying. And... Uh, and from then, my son started having panic attacks and he um, he wouldn't go anywhere. Oh, damn, yeah. What's so, next, Tom? Yeah. We, we could talk for hours, like, and, you know, dissect things and find solutions to things, but it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to meet you and, 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 and see where you're coming from with everything because, you know, it's not all what's out on the media. It's not what's portrayed on I the media. I always say, if you... Stuff. Don't believe what you read in the media. Listen to what I say. Don't see what they say about me. And I, in fact, this next film I'm going to do is a massively important film because I will prove that the stories you're reading are lies. Uh, not, not, but yeah, I ain't perfect and I admit that. So, but I ain't, you know, you started off about hate. Mm. You would never be able to put up or go through the life I've gone through if it was to do with hate. Yeah? You just wouldn't do it. No one could do it. I say, so I, I, it's not, I love, it's full of love. I love my kids. I love my country. I love, I love my community. And what's happened to it is, is wrong, and someone's got to talk about it. I think, I think through the whole uh, interview, I think that the, the, the thing that brightened me up, because there was a lot of hate in it, not hate, sorry, there's a lot of, you know, dark stuff. And, and the, the thing that really warmed to me was when you was talking about coinciding with Muslims and working together. That, that really warmed me. There's no, there's no, it's, it's like there has to be a solution, because we're all here. But what is the solution? The solution ain't pandering. The solution ain't pandering. It's not pandering. And in fact, Muslims respect... I have a lot of Muslims shake my hand. I've had big gang Muslims in, in Luton come up and say, I don't like you, Tommy, yeah? But I do respect you because you stand on what you say, yeah? They, they see you pander, it's a weakness, yeah? Don't pander. Why are we pandering? We don't need to bend our belief. We don't need to bend our country. We don't need to bend Sharia. And they actually respect it. And most, many Muslims, most Muslims don't want to live under Sharia. They, really want, they want freedom. We've come here for freedom. But yeah, and I, and I think that... I think that certainly, look, we can get back onto our Islamic debate once we defeat these globalists. And we're all going to need to unite to stop that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything you, uh, anything final you would want to say to the camera, just to the people out there who are going to be seeing this? Anything yeah. Positive? Yeah. I am banned from everywhere, yeah? Think of this. I've been committed no crime, judged by no court for anything to do with hate speech, anything to do with any speech. Yeah, I, yeah if you mention my name on Facebook, you get banned. You're not even allowed to mention my name. You can mention Hitler's name. You can't mention my name. Yeah. Now, I, this is when I realised I've scared them. Yeah. I scared them because I united an, mass numbers of working class people and people were listening. I, I grew up to 69 million people watching my videos in, in four weeks. Yeah. That scared them. Okay. Because I was able to contradict their lies that they were telling and people would get more distrust in the government and the media, which you should have because it's all a fraud. Yeah. We haven't got freedom of speech. This facade that you think you've got freedom of speech. But I'll just say, I, I, I bought this out. I'm just trying to plug my own book. But that was... It's that, fine. That's banned. So silence. It's just about my story of what they've done, yeah? They banned it from Amazon. You can buy Mein Kampf in 20 different languages on Amazon. You can buy Mein Kampf. Part of history, isn't it? You, yeah, but you can't buy this. Well, so is this. So is this. And I think that history will judge us. I don't care about politicians judging me right now. You can have a lot of negative comments from people saying, ah, this... I don't really care because yeah, history will judge me. I know I'll be proven right. I've been proven right on many of the things I speak about. Yeah? And it's not about hate and it's not about wanting conflict. I don't want conflict, but we've got to be able to speak about the issues if we're going to get anywhere. And now the only place people can find me is on Getter. And when I say, because I like to just point out to all those people who are silencing me that I'm winning, because it's the only, the only, I like punching back because I feel like I'm getting punched all the time. So I do like to come back and say, if I go through now, I am, I am the most 
banned person on any social media, yeah? I'm not allowed on any of them. Last week, I had one and a half million people read my posts, all right? So that's more than any journalist in the UK, yeah? So I'm already, after cancelling me from everything, I'm still the most watched journalist in Britain. So if you want to see my journalism, get on, get out. Thanks, Tom, for coming. Um, Cheers, mate. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Um, let's try and make this country a better place and all work together. Mate, I, I, I've all... No, so, something so people don't get confused. I've agreed to meet with Muslims from day dot, and I've met many imams, yeah? And I've agreed to work with people, just not bend. Just not bend. Not okay. bend to fascism, not bend to extremism, not bend to Islamic ideas, which are oppressive. Just, I will not bend my view on it. No matter how many people want to kill me over it, it's the truth, and I speak the truth, and that truth doesn't involve hate. So, yeah. But you do you do need to work together. You do need to work together. Um, especially to stop the cabal, anyway. The cabal. <laughs> you can all agree on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Um, you know, there were some tough things to listen to in there, but, you know, like we said, we're the freedom of speech and we're the voice through adversity, and that's what we'll stand on. Um, let us know what you think in the comments. I'm sure you're going to leave comments anyway, but, yeah. Till next time, stay central. Cheers. The Central Club.